uh, we're not receiving a passing out the plates for an offering, but uh, we have them at uh, all the corners of the church, so please deposit your offering there. Also, if you'd like to send a, a check to the church, make it out to Winber Assembly and mail it to Box 361, Winber, PA, 15963. Uh, Box 361, Winber. All right, well, today I have a title of a message, and I, you know, sometimes you, uh, for when you're presenting or writing something, you, it's hard to come up with a title. What are you going to say? What are you going? How are you going to put it together? Well, I, I announced this in Sunday school to see if anyone could figure it out what it's about, and the title is "What Dreamers Don't Know and Lions Won't Eat." <laughs> what dreamers don't know and lions won't eat. Anybody know what book of the Bible that might come from? Daniel. <laughs> How many thought Daniel? Eh, a couple, yeah. Okay, what lions won't eat. Well, whenever uh, I was thinking of this and, you know, again, you, you come up with thoughts. Okay, how on earth is Daniel and him going into a lion's den in his... Um, in his uh, life, how is that going to be appropriate for today and whatever? But I started out anyhow, and after I was finished, I said, oh, well, this would work, and this would work. And so anyhow, <laughs> Daniel. So what it does is uh, the book of Daniel gives us an overview of a devastating war in which people were taken from their homes. King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon invaded Israel uh, conquered Judah and uh, conquered uh, and t- you know, took over Israel or took over Jerusalem. And what they did was they took the gold and silver um, things of the, temp- of the temple and the tabernacle and they took it back to Babylon. And then they also took the wisest and the best of the people in a, in a region and they would take them back to Babylon. That was their way of transforming the the culture of a society was to take the best of that society and take them out of their culture and bring them and reinsert them into the Babylonian. So in chapter 1, verse 1, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and surrounded it with his armies. This happened during the third year that Jehoiakim was king of Judah. The Lord allowed Nebuchadnezzar to defeat Jehoiakim, king of Judah. So one of the things we learn off the bat is God withdrew his support or his uh, protection from Judah. They had been serving other gods. They had been, uh, gave up on their religion, gave up on their faith, and God, through the prophets, warned them, you can't do this or you're going to, there's going to be consequences. Well, It was interesting, if you read that part of history, you find out that these people said, well, we'll see what happens. That's what they told the prophet. The prophet says, you know, if you guys don't straighten out, you're you're going to, you know, God's not going to let you keep living like this. And they said, well, we'll kind of see what happens. Well, this is what happened. King Nebuchadnezzar came. Now, the year is about 605 B.C., and... um, we, we, as I mentioned, Nebuchadnezzar, his philosophy was uh, whenever you conquer a country, you take the best of that society and you take it back to Babylon, reinsert it into your own culture to re-educate them. Well, one of the things that we find in this lesson is the divine providence of God. And the divine providence of God is that he is sovereign. And he find, we find a way that God has a will and a purpose, but in that will and purpose, each of us have a will. (laughs) Each of us make decisions along that way. And we find that for um, this with Daniel, till you know the most, he says that, that God would be with him, God would guide him, but we just don't figure out how it all comes together. So whenever we're looking at the sovereignty We find that throughout the scriptures, it's in Timothy, Paul writes to Timothy and says, to the king of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Uh, Daniel, whenever he spoke to Nebuchadnezzar, he says, to you know that the most high rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. So when we're putting together this war, (laughs) 
this invasion of Babylon into Jerusalem and on Judah, we find that it was part of God's plan to bring the nation of Israel back to its roots and its faith. But it would take a devastating event to cause Israel to depend again on God. And so we find this taking place. And um, we know that in the, all of this, God has a plan. So verse 3. Then King Nebuchadnezzar ord ordered Asphanaz, the man in charge of his officials, to bring some of the boys into the palace and train them. He was to include boys from among the Israelites, from important Judean families, and from the royal family of Judah. So, we find out who these, these individuals are that are, have been transported from Judah. They are the royal family. They are the most prominent citizens and their kids. And in this group of individuals are four boys. <laughs> you know, four boys. And these boys, Daniel is one of them, as we'll get to in a moment, they're anywhere from 14 to 16 years old. So they are transported from their families, they're taken from their home, and by a foreign king and foreign army, brought back to Babylon to be repatronized. repatronized. So King Nebuchadnezzar wanted only healthy boys that did not have any bruises, any scars, or anything wrong with their bodies. They would be handsome, smart young men who were able to learn things quickly and easily to serve in his palace. And when I read that, I thought of Dylan. <laughs> right, Dylan? You say amen. A, that was one of those amen moments from over in there. So, so he's, you know, he wanted handsome, smart, learn things quickly, easily serve in, serve in a palace. Yeah, Dylan, that's it. I just rang it right up. That's how I knew that his sermon was for this day. So um, the king then told Aspenaz that he wanted to teach these young, men, these young men the language and the writing of the Chaldeans. So they also were to learn the mathematics, astronomy, history, science. They were to learn all of these things, and they were to learn them in the, in the schools of Babylon. And they had these special teachers. All right. Trials. Um, when change comes, trials. King Nebuchadnezzar gave the young men a certain amount of food. Now, what happened was, it, it, sp it speaks about how that Daniel and his three, three friends um, were given the same food that the king had. So that'd be pretty good. But what happened is, Daniel, okay, here you are, 14 years old. You're in a foreign country, <laughs> And you're in the king's palace, and everybody is under the command of the king, and they bring you the king's food, and you tell the, your servers, sorry, I won't eat that. It's against my religion. <laughs> you try and do that today, it's like, you're nuts. You know? But here is Daniel and his three friends. They won't eat the food because the food was sacrificed to idols. And in that country, in that time period, there would be the priests of these uh, different temples. They would go to the slaughterhouses, and they would dedicate all of the animals to these gods, and then the animals would be sacrificed, and then their food would be taken to the, uh, to the, to the king and to other places. Well, Daniel says, we can't eat that. It's offered to idols. So we find that when you're in a strange country... <laughs> And when you're in a very difficult situation, always maintain your faith. <laughs> you're going to know in your heart what's right and what's not. And no matter how strange it may be and how difficult it may be, always know that your faith will give you a conscience and give you direction as to what you should or should not do. And so, verse 9, God caused Aphanas... Uh, the man who was charged, and the official who was in charge, we find that when Daniel said, we can't eat this, Daniel found favor with this individual who was in charge of all these, all these young men and people that had been transplanted to Babylon. 
and all of those who were in this special training. So it wasn't just these four. It was many other areas and many other men, young men from their society. They were brought there, and, but God allowed Daniel and his three friends to have favor, meaning that God's blessing was upon their life and people recognized that there was something different about them. God recognized and the, the official recognized these guys, there's something different. And that's where we look at in our own lives that there is something unique about each one of us, that God has a purpose for our life and he has created us for such a time as this, last week's sermon, that God has created us and put us in these places where we have a special impact and a special purpose. And so God will open doors or he will close doors for us that we should not go through or we should go or we should pursue. Verse 10, um, I am afraid of my master. So ask Penis, he, he tells Daniel, Daniel, I can't honor your request because you don't want to eat meat. You want to eat vegetables. You want to be a vegetarian. And you do that, and you're going to look bad, and then the king's going to see you look bad, and he's going to come and take off my head. <laughs> a simple matter. And Daniel says, no, give us a trial. Give us 10 days, three weeks, whatever it is here. He says, you know, 10 days. He says, give us 10 days. And after the 10-day period, look at us and evaluate if things are different. Well, we find that the guard agreed, verse 14, to test Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah for 10 days. And at the end of the 10 days, they look healthier, stronger, better than the others. And so verse 17, God gave these four young men the wisdom and ability to learn many different kinds of writings and science. Daniel could also understand all kinds of visions and dreams. So we find that it wasn't the vegetarian diet, <laughs> you know, that changed everything, that made Daniel and his friends better than all the rest. It says that God gave these young men wisdom and ability to learn. It doesn't say God came along and just dumped it in their head. Teachers, how many of you know students that think it's going to be dumped in their heads <laughs> and it doesn't get dumped? It's not there when test days come. Yeah. That's why I always had straight A's in school. <laughs> I got to watch out for lightning. It sometimes comes down here. So um, we find that God was with Daniel and his friends because they did what they knew was right in their heart. See, when we do things to honor God and we do things that God would be pleased with, God has a way of helping us out, his blessing on our life. And so Daniel and them were able to learn. And so they could um, learn. They could learn faster, greater, better uh, than, their, than their counterparts. And so God gave them skills and wisdom. We find that in verse 19, the king talked to them. So three years They've been in school for three years. So now they're maybe 16, 18 years old. And um, the king brought them in and talked to them and found that these young men uh, were as good as Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. None of the other young men were as good as these guys. Every time the king asked them about something important, they showed great wisdom and understanding. The king found they were 10 times better than all the magicians and wise men in the kingdom. So we find that God had a way of blessing the, these Daniel and his three friends. God had a way of blessing them in such a way that we found that God's favor was on their life and they learned and they applied and they were 10 times greater than the others. What dreamers don't know. Chapter 2. During Nebuchadnezzar's second year, king had a dream, and the dream bothered him. And he was, he was upset with this dream because he knew it was important, and he, you know, often at this time period, when people had dreams, they thought that the dreams came from the gods, 
and it was the way gods, the gods communicated with, with humans. And so the kings especially, they would have magicians and astrologers and all these people in their court to interpret their dreams. So it was very common for this to take place. Well, we find that um, the king, he has this dream, and he says, verse 5, Then King Nebuchadnezzar said to them, You must tell me the dream, and then you must tell me what it means. So the king brings all of his important men in, but Daniel's not in there. For whatever reason, he's not in with this group at this moment. And so the king brings them all in, and he says, Okay, I've had a dream, and it's a very important dream, and I want you to tell me the dream, and I want you to tell me what it means. Or I'm going to kill you. <laughs> it's that way in those, those times. Do this or die. You have a choice. Okay? Tell me what the dream was, and I'll let you live. Well, the wise men, what do they do? King, <laughs> tell us the dream, and we'll tell you the meaning. Well, they pleaded, and what do you think happened? Kill them all. <laughs> That was the king's decree. So when, the king, so when they came to kill Daniel, Daniel says, wait, 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 wait. What are you doing? And so Daniel decides what dreamers don't know. Daniel goes to the king and says, you know what? Give me some time till tomorrow. I'll come back, I'll tell you the dream, and I'll tell you its answer. In our lives, there are times in which we are faced with difficult situations that are totally impossible in our natural realm. It's completely impossible for us to understand it, to figure it out, to do it. But we know that we, in Daniel, what he did was, he and his three, Daniel goes back to his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He goes back to those guys and he says, I want us to pray, and this is the reason and during the night, God gave to Daniel the dream and the interpretation. You see, in our life, there are times in which the only way we're going to get through this is if God gives us some understanding. God gives us some insight. God gives to us something that we couldn't figure out on our own. And so we go and we pray and we ask for God to help me out here. And in our life, when we face those times, we, you know, Daniel didn't give up on his faith when he was taken from his homeland. He kept to his, his what he knew was right in his heart. And now, he, he goes back to God, he goes to God, he's been faithful in serving God, and now he's asking God to give him the impossible. <laughs> and I won't sing the song to dream an impossible dream. <laughs> That was an amen. So when Daniel, when Daniel received this knowledge of this dream, he says, praise God's name forever and ever. Power and wisdom belong to him. He changes the times and seasons. He gives power to kings, and he takes their power away. He gives wisdom to people so they can be wise. He lets people learn things and become wise. He knows hidden secrets that are hard to understand. Light lives with him. So he knows what is in the dark and the secret places. You gave me wisdom and power. You told us what we asked for. You told us about the king's dream. So you can imagine what it was like for Daniel to go back in and tell the king, this is what your dream was. You had on this huge statue, there was this head of gold. King Nebuchadnezzar, you're the head. Then he goes into, there was uh, shoulders. And he goes into the Medes and the Persians. And he said, these are the dreams. And Daniel talks to the king and tells, this is about you and about the future. And some of this dream of Daniel's and some of this interpretation that comes to through Daniel to Nebuchadnezzar, is still in our future. Because he talks about the Medes and the Persians, and he talks about the Grecian, the bronze, and then the iron, the Romans, and the feet of iron and clay. 
which is kind of still in our future. And how that there is a rock that comes without, <laughs> with, you know, out of nowhere and destroys the, the image and it's blown away like chaff in the winds and that kingdom that is in the rock expands and takes over the whole earth in this kingdom of God. Well, we move to chapter 5. <clears throat> chapter 5. Daniel is now 66 years old since chapter one long time so all these things just don't happen year after year they are a sequence of events chapter uh, chapter five the persian army has surrounded babylon okay and the king of of uh, babylon now has changed you know nebuchadnezzar's gone and his great great grandson or whomever is in charge and what the king does he has this party. The, the um, Persians have surrounded the kings, the, the city of Babylon. But the king is so arrogant, he throws a party for a thousand of his officials. Celebration party. We're impregnable. We can't be defeated. Our city can never be destroyed. You ever hear the expression, handwriting on the wall? <laughs> You can't even read the handwriting on the wall. This is where it comes from. Because this is the night, this is the time that the king of Babylon is arrogantly drinking and using the cups and plates from the temple of God in Jerusalem and using them for his own party. And while he's doing this, over by the nightstand, there is a hand and writes these words on the wall. And everybody's, whoa. It's, it's, I, I like what it says here about the king. Um, Suddenly a person's hand appeared and began writing on the wall. The finger scratched words. This is verse 5. The scratched words into the plaster on the wall and near the lampstand in the king's palace, the king was watching the hand as it wrote. King Belshazzar, not Balthazar, Belshazzar, this is different than Daniel. King Belshazzar was very afraid. His face became white from fear, and his knees were shaking and knocking together. <laughs> he was kind of scared. He could not stand up because his legs were too weak. <laughs> he was scared to death. I mean, you know, how many, how many of you seen a hand appear on the wall and write words on the wall, and nobody knows what it means? So he's all upset. He can't, he can't figure out what's going on. And so what happens? His mother or former queen, maybe, the, maybe his um, father, uh, his wife comes in. But anyhow, whoever it is, she remembers, what are you all upset about? There's a guy in your kingdom who can read and interpret dreams. His name is Daniel. Send for him. So, in comes Daniel. He looks at the words, and, and the king offers him. He says, I'll give you third. You'll be the third uh, person in control. And the, only, the reason he could only offer him three positions, the third position was, uh, Bel Belshazzar was the son, and his father was king. And so they were co-regents, and his father was out trying to establish the uh, trade routes that the, the Medes and the Persians, um, the Persian, they, they had interrupted. And so he's out trying to reestablish their trade routes and left his son in charge of Babylon, and his son throws a party. <laughs> and uh, he's in trouble. And so the handwriting on the wall is the meaning, meaning God has numbered the days until your kingdom will end. Okay, Daniel's now telling the king this. Tiki, you have been weighed on the scale and found not good. You've been found wanting. And then uh, per horizon, your kingdom is being taken from you and it will be divided among the Medes and the Persians. Well, that very night, Belshazzar, the king of Babylon, was killed. The Medes, no, Persians, 
had, there was a river that came through Babylon that was their water source. They diverted the water while all these people were partying and they, came, they invaded the city through the water, through the riverbed, and they defeated Babylon. Well, this guy's having a party. So, the man named Darius the Mede became the new king and Darius was about 62 years old. Now, the great thing here is, okay, transition. Daniel is somewhere now around 80 years old. So we have 66 years, and then we have the fall of that kingdom, fall of Babylon, and the Darius, the Mede, comes in and says, Daniel, we, we've heard about you. <laughs> and he makes him, Daniel just transfers from being a great man of influence over the Babylonian empire to being third in command, fourth in command, because there's three of them, over all of the Persian empire. Whoever hears of such a thing? Well, so Daniel now is um, 80 years old. There's three top administrators. And Darius thought it would be a good idea to choose 120, this is chapter 6, verse 1, 120 satraps to rule through the kingdom. He chose three men to rule over the 120, and Daniel was one of the three supervisors. Okay. Now, go back to the beginning. Daniel would not allow himself to be defiled by doing something wrong, eating the meat that was offered to idols. Who would have known? but he and his three friends. But Daniel made up his mind he was going to do the right thing for the right reason. And so at 14, 15, 16 years old, he made a decision that influenced him the whole way through his life. Now he's 80 years old, and he's still in power. He's still finding favor in, in administration and, and in government. And Daniel proved himself to be a better supervisor than any of the others. He's still number one. <laughs> the king was so impressed with Daniel that he planned to make him ruler over the whole kingdom. Whoa. But what happens when you're number one? Let's think. Uh, people criticize People find fault. People have a way of twisting things around. And so the other two guys, you know, there's three of them, and Daniel now is going to be number one over those two that's left, and the 120. Well, they don't like Daniel because he doesn't serve the same God they do. So what do they do? Let's find a mistake, a fault, where he has cheated the king. <laughs> because they cheated the king. They fought surely Daniel. They went through all of his work, all of that he did. They couldn't find one fault in anything that Daniel had done. So now, they said, if we're going to find anything wrong with him, we've got to discover what it is, and he's got to find there's something wrong with he and his religion, his God. So... They appealed to King Darius. Darius, this is the king now of the Persians, he had a lot of pride. And the, these, these guys come in and they say, Darius, live forever. We, wanna, we want you to pass a law that nobody can pray to anybody but you for 30 days. And the king says, you sure? <laughs> you sure? He said, yeah, we want you to sign it into law. So the king signed it into law. 30 days, nobody can pray to anybody but me. So they're all excited because these people who had tricked the king into, and they even signed, assigned what will happen, anybody who doesn't listen to the king's command will be fed to the lions. <laughs> yeah, it's a common way of execution. So... When the king, what happens? Daniel knows that the king is signed into law. Anybody who prays goes to the den. 
But what did Daniel do? Daniel prayed every day three times. Every day, Daniel would kneel down in his window where everybody could see, and he would pray three times a day. So in the morning, whenever he's praying, these guys go to the king and says, King, did you sign a law that said nobody should pray? That's right, I signed a law. Well, you know, Daniel, the guy you like, the guy you think should be over all of us, he's praying. Well, uh, the, the king is like, oh, no, what have I done? Because he likes Daniel. All day, he tries to figure out a way to keep Daniel from the lion's den. And what happens is they come back in the afternoon and say, King, it's a law. You can't change the law. They, these guys had tricked the king to kill Daniel. And so the king says, take him to the lion's den. Verse 15. Remember, king, the laws of the Medes and Persians? Verse 16. So the king gave the order. They brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. And the king said this, May the God you serve save you. You see, the king knew that there was something special about Daniel. And in our life, there is something special about you. It's not just your personality, your way of thinking. It's God's blessing upon your life. It's God, you honor God in your life, and God honors you by making you someone special. We are all God's favorite child. We are all God's favorite child. I like, if if God had a refrigerator, your picture would be on it. (laughs) How many have pictures on your refrigerator? If God had a picture, I mean, God refrigerated your picture beyond because you're his favorite child. And so he invests himself in us. And so Daniel then goes into the lion's den. He's 80 years old. The king threw Daniel in. And in verse 20, he was worried. The king was. And he couldn't sleep all night in the first light of the morning He goes down to the lions, then he called to Daniel and said, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God been able to save you from the lions? You always serve your God. And Daniel said, I'm still here. (laughs) King, live forever. He didn't have a grudge against the king for throwing him in the lions then. In our life, no matter where we are at, no matter if we're in a den of lions, God has a way to keep us and protect us. And what happens is, Daniel says, my God sent his angels to save me. The angel closed the lion's mouth. The lions have not hurt me because my God knows I am innocent. I never did any wrong and never did anything wrong to you, king. Hmm. Daniel's out of the lion's den. But you know the people who plotted against Daniel? They forgot the other law in the kingdom that the punishment that was to be given that they issued to someone wrongfully now went to them. (laughs) That's why all of these people who came to the king and plotted against Daniel, they put them in the lion's den. And what happens is it talks about how that these people never even made it to the bottom, (laughs) that the, the lions tore them apart before they even hit the bottom. Daniel slept with them all night. So in our life, we serve a living God and he is sovereign over all things. We go through things in life and we not always, don't always understand them, but God is with us and he helps us and gives us his grace and his mercy and his peace in those times of decision. So we stay true to our faith and God will bless us. What dreamers don't know, it takes a believer It takes someone who knows God to see things that aren't really there, but are there. What dreamers don't know, there is a word that God can place in our heart and mind to understand things and see things that just aren't the obvious to everyone. When the writing is on the wall, be at peace. God has a message. 
not just for you, but for those around you. God will see you through. And Daniel was able to transfer leadership through all of the Babylonian Empire and into the Medes and the Persians because God blessed him because Daniel was faithful to God. And last, when people plot against you, the outcome appears to be certain. There's no way out of this. When people plot against you, they try and seal the trap. But God has a way of trapping people. They get ensnared in their own traps. So our life, yes, God is a sovereign God. He gives us choices. Daniel and his friend made their choice at the beginning. We will be true to what God has called us to do, to serve God, to keep his, keep his laws, and God will keep us. Amen? Let's stand. <laughs> What's that? Father, we thank you <laughs> that you give to us a very special purpose that in these letters, these books, God, we know that you have helped us. You will shed your word upon our lives, our lives and a light onto our own path, so we are grateful. We ask, Lord, as you were with Daniel, you will be with us. Lord, we pray that you will be with Dylan and that you will guide him in his life as you already have. So, Lord, we ask your blessing now to be upon us. We thank you, Lord, that we will serve you with gladness and faithfulness. And, Lord, you will be our strength and our help in every need that we have. In Jesus' name, amen.